Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 31 of the Training Tidbits podcast show. I'm your host, Ryan Cartledge from Animal Training Academy, and I'm extremely excited about having you here with us today for this latest episode. And I've been looking forward to this one for quite a while now because we're going to be talking to someone who has been a huge inspiration to me after I acquired one of his books, Carrots and Sticks, a number of years ago. Some of you listening might already own this book or you might have read it, and I was actually speaking to an ATA member just this past week from Germany who said it was at the top of their to buy list and they're going to be doing some extra horse training classes with their clients just to be able to pay for it. More on these books and their offers soon. For now though, I just want to quickly in- inject some acknowledgement and gratitude of those that have been sharing and liking this podcast show as we fast approach over 20,000 downloads. It's amazing and I get inspired thinking about all the people that have benefited from all the wisdom our podcast podcast guests have shared. Today's episode is, of course, going to be no exception to this. And if you do enjoy today's episode, then please share it as far and as wide as you possibly can. And one easy way to do this for those listening on their mobile devices is you'll see next to the title of this episode, three little dots. If you click on those dots, a little menu will pop up and one of the options in that menu will be to share this episode. Piece of cake, nice and easy and really quick. And that's how you listening can do your part to improve improve animals' lives everywhere. That would be really appreciated. But now on to today's guest, one Paul McGreevy. Paul BVSC PhD is a riding instructor, veterinarian, and ethologist. He is Professor of Animal Behaviour and Animal Welfare Science at the University of Sydney's School of Veterinary Science. The author of over 200 peer-reviewed scientific publications and six books, Paul has received numerous Australian and international awards for his research and teaching innovations. He is a co-founder and honorary fellow of the International Society for Equitation Science. With federal funding, he currently leads a consortium of all the Australian and New Zealand veterinarian faculties that is developing curriculum resources for the teaching of animal welfare science and ethics. He also leads the Vet Compass Initiative that has brought together all the Australian veterinarian schools to provide national disease surveillance for companion animals and horses. It is without further ado and my very great pleasure to welcome one Paul McGreevy onto the show today. Paul, are you there? How are you? It's great to be here, Ryan, hearing you loud and clear. Fantastic. It's so wonderful to have you here and in our audience eardrums today. Before we get officially started on today's episode, I would just like to add that we are dedicating this episode to Paul's dog, Tinker, who recently left us. Here's to you, Tink. But on that note, let's get started and dive straight in with today's first question. And this question is all about dogmanship. Paul, can we start off here with you telling everyone listening about this, what it is, where they can find out more, and your involvement in dogmanship and its research? Okay, yeah, I'd be glad to talk about this because it's a, it's a really exciting topic for all of us working on the dogmanship team. Dogmanship is essentially all about an individual's ability to interact with and train dogs so good dogmanship involves best practice in dog human interactions and i think it has a fundamental role in the success of dogs as both companions and as co-workers and the essence of it is to reflective practitioners to be aware of our role in the dog's success in every training situation and as a co-worker and occupying our homes and our worlds as companions. We know that the dog-human partnership is highly relevant to all of us who adore our dogs and depend on them for companionship and partnership that we've had. But of course, there are many dysfunctional relationships and their negative consequences, including unwelcome behaviours and eventual relinquishment, persist as we know. So human behaviour definitely is part of the picture. And I've been inspired to look at at the the human's role in dog behaviour and dog emotional states, because I think it can be pivotal to the success of any dog-human team. Our current dog research is focusing on the human attributes that influence dog behavior and we're identifying the optimal ways to interact with dogs. Dogmanship includes an examination of the psychological
biological underpinnings that contribute to how humans interact with dogs. So we have to be aware of our own personality and what we're bringing to each training session or each learning opportunity. And there are aspects of, of dogmanship and our studies that, that are revealing, for instance, why many women show better dog handling and um, training skills than their male counterparts. So there's um, a lot of a room for humility in this exercise. Uh, and there's a user guide to dogmanship on the University of Sydney's website, isn't there? And can you tell us about that? The dogmanship team includes a number of players and one of the, those who springs to mind for a special mention is Elissa Payne because she has done a PhD on dogmanship and she's revealed the role of uh, positive reinforcement and how as default to positive reinforcement before other parts of the four quadrants of operant conditioning. And Alyssa has also revealed and helped to emphasize the role of our own personality in the interactions we have with dogs. She has helped to confirm the role of human personality traits and how they reliably influence behavior. An example is if you score highly on the neuroticism dimension in a human personality test, you're likely to confuse your dog. That's probably because you're giving too much information. You can imagine if somebody is very scoring very highly on, on this neuroticism dimension they might be moving their hands a lot they might be talking rapidly they might be repeating themselves and so they're creating a lot of white noise for the dog if they were just a little calmer then they might calm discrete signals are easier for the dogs to read equally if you score highly on conscientiousness in the human personality dimensions a better tune out of your dog you probably are going to commit more time to training we certainly find that with farm dog trainers and you're probably more diligent about returning to basics and perhaps you are also more consistent in the way you give your cues because we know that good training is based on consistency and timing and being able to read the animal in front of you so we call reflective practitioners understanding how good we are or how poor we are at certain aspects of those challenges is critical to dogmanship we need to be our own worst critics and use instance such as you do to allow us to unpick what's happening and and, and to be humble about the role we may have in confusing our animal, because that's a critical step to take. Once we appreciate that we can improve and we're aware of our weaknesses as well as our strengths, then we're bound to be better practitioners. And examining our own personality traits and knowing what we bring to the party is an important part of the process. Yeah, this is really interesting, Paul, because we've talked about this on the podcast before in different ways of training. And specifically, we had a guest from Denmark, Jan Ostergaard on the show and he talked about what he calls square training which is very much staying as still as he can with his hands by his side and only moving when the dog does what he wants and then he clicks and then he does movement of the hands and vocalizations and stuff after this and I, and I thought that was interesting but you're saying that this kind of potentially comes down to the personality of the person training rather than a specific skill set they've learned with regards to how they should train I think they they both intertwine they're intimately involved with each other the conscientious people are more likely to be consistent and perhaps be better at uh, their timing and, and consistent in their timing whereas somebody who's scoring highly on the neuroticism dimension we know that they need their dogs perhaps more than p people with less neuroticism but they are unfortunately we think confusing their dogs so they might be particularly likely to benefit from that sort of reflective process we know that we have to observe the animal in front of us to know what works we know have to know to look at the animal to know what is reinforcing and what's deleting or punishing behavior behaviors so we know the importance of looking at the animal but we need to, i'm just saying we need to look at ourselves and how we behave could be a combination of, of our innate and also some of the skills that we have repeated without necessarily reflecting on how good they actually are what we've discovered as part of this really enjoyable process of, of understanding and exploring dogmanship is the role of emotional intelligence and that term has been used many times to describe how people interact with other humans I think we can extend it to other species. And that's part of what Alyssa Payne did with her PhD, showed that, that people who are attentive to the animal's effective state and can respond accordingly to what they're reading in the animal um, are going to get a better tune out of the animal. So knowing how to read the animal, knowing what effective state it may be in and moderating in the light of what you've learned and what you've seen is a critical part of emotional intelligence that we think factors into dogmanship. Another attribute that we see 
in people who show what we call great dogmanship is their ability to capture and retain the dog's attention. They're actually relevant to the dog. They're of interest to the dog. They're salient. And these are all of how we can engage with the dogs in front of us and um, keep them interested. It's not just about bones raining from the sky, although that's a gorgeous notion. It's about being relevant to the animal, being, if you like, some sort of inspiration to the animal. So the animals are looking to us, we know how opportunistic dogs are and what a great gift we have as, as dog trainers to tap into that boundless enthusiasm and that love of fun and, and play. So being a source of joy and source of fun to dogs is just part of the way in which we can keep their attention and keep them looking back at us for more clues at as to how to get the best out of life. And that's why I think of the best owners and the best people with the best dogmanship are essentially life coaches for dogs. There's the term reflective practitioner that's been used a lot of the time in recent years for, to describe lifelong learning within the professions. So to continue their professional development on a continual basis, obviously for the rest of their careers and even into retirement, so that they become aware of cutting edge approaches, they refresh their skills, um, they take on new information. And I think it's critical that trainers adopt the same approach because if they carry on doing what they've always done, they will always get the same results. We need to be as flexible as possible to learn from each other and learn from the animals in front of us. And by being a reflective practitioner, we are able to bring some humility to the party and reflect on the way we are doing things and review the way we're doing things, moderate the way we're doing things and collect data on the way that those changes have affected our outcomes. So a critical role day-to-day -day business of anybody who wants to be a reflective practitioner as part of being someone with great dogmanship would be to to collect data and that's where I think dog logbook comes into its own. Dog logbook is essentially what it says on the can. It's a, a logbook for people with dogs to describe how you're managing your dog, how you're feeding your dog, what your dog's weight is, what your dog's day-to-day -day activities involve, how much joy you, your dog appears to be getting from those activities, how your dog was socialized as a pup and how it values the different activities at it um, on a daily basis. And from that we we can begin to get a glimpse into the dog's quality of life and our role in ensuring that it has a great life. And so this dog logbook that has been created is an app that people can get on their mobile devices. Is that correct? That's right. Dog logbook is a free app that's been made available um, through the University of Sydney and it allows owners to make a profile for each of the dogs that they share time with and it collects data for the owners to share with their vets or with their behaviour therapists or trainers so you can nominate to receive the data if you're a professional helping somebody train a dog you could use this app to actually monitor what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis in that dog's life and on it in its training schedules so that you can show where you see particular improvements or uh, perhaps even dips in performance or dips in the engagement in certain activities so i'd encourage people to have a look at this it's, it's free and you can use as many or as few features within the app as you wish um, there is a lot there there's a lot of of possible variables that can be recorded everything from um, signs of dementia through epilepsy so quite a lot of health records can be pumped into this app it will give you reminders when your preventative medicine is required so wormers and um, vaccines and so forth and we know that vets are appreciating that sort of sort of communication with their clients but the, for me one of the most exciting things is that owners can put the data into to the app and it's stored online they can go to a website and see graphs of those trends over time and they can consult a professional who can they can share those graphs with to get a, a better picture of how things are changing over time whether they're changing for the better or the worse. There are ways in which these data could be used to help us with end-of-life decisions, which we know are terribly difficult. And the more they're underpinned by data, the better. And there are suites of questions about seizures. There are suites of questions about, I mean, so many things that this dog log can do to help owners monitor what matters for their dogs. Fantastic. And I was telling you before the podcast, so we had someone from Denmark message me today saying they had just downloaded it. So we'll additionally put a link to the dog logbook app 
in the podcast write up. Does that suit you, Paul? Cool. That's great. Yep. So interesting. And the reality is we could talk all day just on dogmanship, I think. Uh, but we will move on and talk about some other really interesting areas of dog related research that you are involved in. And these are about how dog morphology and genetics influence behavior and just quickly on the role of desexing on dog behavior. Could you dive into some of the research around these two topics for us, please, Paul? Sure. I'd be delighted to. I've been working with a great colleague and a great friend of mine, Professor James Sapel from the University of Pennsylvania. I've been working with him for some years now. He has an online questionnaire for dogs, uh, for dog owners, I should say, to describe their dog's behavior, a 100 item questionnaire. So this has been rolling around on the main maybe 12 years and he's now got data on over 65,000 dogs and he and I've been looking at what the data have to say about dogs of different makes and shapes and we know that different breeds can be identified by their head shape and their height and possibly their, their build their body weight and in exploring how the dog's morphology how those variables can be used to predict the way the animal will behave we know that sight hounds for instance the whippets, greyhounds, afghans and salukis, for example, all seem to have long pointy skulls. Previous research from my lab has shown, that's my laboratory, not my Labrador, has shown that the, the, <laughs> the retinas of the dogs with the longer skulls differ quite significantly from normal dog and markedly, again, from the dogs with short skulls. So they're seeing the world through different eyes. We've also shown that these dogs with different skull shapes have different brain shapes. So the likelihood is that they're processing that visual information differently. So we shouldn't be surprised that dogs with different head shapes are behaving differently. But that's what I was interested in exploring with the, the data from James in Pennsylvania. The website that he runs is called CBOC, which is the Canine Behavior Assessment Research Questionnaire. So anyone who's interested can website. And rather like Dog Logbook, you can compare your dog with dogs of similar breeds. So you can see where your dog fits into the available data for that type of dog. What we found was that the short skull dogs in our study uh, were significantly more likely to show compulsive staring, self-grooming, allo grooming, which is grooming others, and dog-directed aggression. And they were significantly less likely to show chasing. So this kind of confirmed what we observed before, that the short skull dogs, in contrast to our sight hounds, are showing less chasing. Interestingly, they also show less stealing of food. And anyone who's had a whippet in their lives may resonate with that observation, because I don't know, but there's some sort of stealthy gene in whippets and greyhounds that you know, is of enormous interest to me. But so the shorter the skull, the less food stealing we see, the less stranger directed fear we see in the short skull dogs. That may contribute to why the pugs and the French bulldogs and Boston terriers are so charming as companions. And it's just part of the story, I know. But they also, the short skull dogs also show less persistent barking. So there are good things and bad things about being a short skull dog. And we really need to appreciate that, for me at least, remind me that there is no such thing as normal dog behavior we have to work out what the, the dog's morphology is before we start saying well this is normal for that dog uh, or abnormal for that dog in terms of height we dogs are significantly more likely to show urination when left alone and more likely to show defecation when left alone and more likely to show other separation related problems and more likely to show attachment and attention seeking so the shorter animals seem to be high risk for those sorts of potential bonding issues they also show dog directed fear and that's perhaps understandable if you're short and you're surrounded by big dogs and all that you can see is dog ankles in your world then you you, you might be a bit fearful of being in, in that sort of company unless you've been really well socialized they also show more owner directed aggression and more touch sensitivity so i don't know i mean we need to do far these are just these are significant findings but they really just set up hypotheses for later testing i do wonder whether shorter dogs are more likely to be swooped up by their owners in an emergency in a way that larger taller dogs are, cannot be picked up and maybe that contributes to some sort of defense and maybe it contributes to some sort of owner directed aggression just to say give me my space and that may also be why they're more touch sensitive 
we also found that in, this is quite interesting I, I think that shorter dogs were more likely to roll in feces and more likely to show urine marking perhaps when you're shorter you're closer to ground based olfactory stimuli and perhaps that's why we see more interaction with feces and more urine marking if you're short person you are close to the ground if you're a dog if you're a short dog you're every time you sniff one of those lamp posts that everyone wants to wee on you're privy to more stimuli um, because everything everyone, everyone else's urine has descended into that lower section so maybe you're getting huge stimulation huge motivation to overmark just because you're closer to the rich dense signals we also see in shorter dogs more begging for food more mounting of people and objects and strangely um, chasing i can't really begin to explain those those findings but again these are setting us up for future um, research questions the other thing that's that's interesting to me is that the shorter dogs are less likely to show trainability now if you think about it there could be a, a logical explanation for that that the shorter dogs being closer to the ground are apparently further away from the owner's face and the owner's hands so their ability to appreciate the salience of the owner's hand signals and certainly the owner's social referencing cues may be compromised by being further away. I'm just speculating here, but it's really interesting for those of us who enjoy animal training to speculate on the, the role of the distance that we have to have from our um, trainees. And so dog height could be a manifestation of that. Weight was interesting. We found that the lighter dogs are significantly more likely to show dog rivalry. Can't really explain that, but they are more likely to also more likely to show more energy, more excitability, more hyperactivity, and more escaping or roaming. And I think this is because because you're light, you can actually move around in space more. Your ability to be a an energetic, excitable, hyperactive form of Canis familiaris is boosted by being light. You know, you can imagine some of the those gorgeous mastiffs struggling to show the same levels of energy, excitability, and hyperactivity as something like a Bazenji. And we know that Bazengis are past masters at escaping. Maybe they're using their physicality to help get over barriers in ways that chunkier dogs um, and heavier dogs cannot. So for my wonderful little Phoebe, who's half Chihuahua, I should be training her on a stool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't you get on the stool. It's the stools for her, Ryan. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, and, you know, it's, it is really interesting from the just from the optics perspective, the shorter skull dogs also, because we know their the retinas are different, they are able to see more detail in the in the center of their visual field than the sight hounds. So people sometimes say, oh, you know, greyhounds are there are there are 14 different breeds that in the breed standard call for aloofness or wariness in the temperament section of the breed standard. And most of them happen to have long skulls. So I think what we interpret as aloofness or wariness or disengagement could be because those long skull dogs are actually observing more in the periphery because the shorter skull dogs have more vision that's, that's akin to human vision so um your chihuahua probably has a concentration of ganglion cells in the center of her visual field that allow her to get good visual acuity in that central field but the more you can that her ability to see what you're doing and and, and the new nuances of, of your signaling could be compromised just by her being so far away from you the more you can appreciate that and the, the role of her different retina compared to other dogs then the, the more we can come to the party and treat each animal as an individual yeah that's really interesting and just before we move on can we just briefly touch on the role of de-sexing on dog behavior as well uh yes well the data on this project have yet to be published but again we're using CBARC data to examine the relationship between the two gonadal hormones and the animal's behavior because so we've shown that behavior co-varies with body shape and head shape now we're asking what about lifetime exposure to gonadal hormones and by that i mean generally i'm referring to testosterone in the males and estrogen in the females that's to be extremely simplistic but we're interested in how the brain responds to these hormones 
hormones. And the wonderful thing about the CBARC data set is that Professor Serple, when he set up that questionnaire, had the presence of mind to ask when the dog had been desexed or neutered. And this project is going to give us some wonderful insights into how lifetime exposure to testosterone, because we're doing male dogs first, can the emergence of unwelcome behaviours. And certainly, I'd say watch this space. The results so far have really surprised most of us who have been working on this project. But I, I want to wait until we've got this work through peer review before I get back to you with the details, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. And for those listening, uh, and we might have mentioned this at the start, forgive me if we've covered it already. Already, but the CBARC questionnaire, I could link to that additionally in the show notes as well, can't I? Yep, yep, great. Fascinating. And I know this will give so many people listening so much useful information and especially food for thought. Now, we've got one more doggy question to go before we move on. And we're going to talk about an area of dog training that we haven't really yet breached on the podcast show. And this is to do with farm dogs. Paul, can you please share with everyone listening a little bit about farm dog training and their welfare? Sure, I'd, I'd be delighted to. This is a project that, um, again, has involved some wonderful PhD students. I'm so blessed with the students that come into my lab and, and who make me look good. They're a wonderful set of people. Um, so this is specifically um, work by Liz Arnott and Jonathan Early. We were lucky enough to get some funding from the Rural Industries Research and Development Corporation and some help from the working Kelpie Cats of Australia uh, with additional funding from Meat and Livestock Australia because there was an appreciation that the dogs that are working on farms are probably the unsung heroes of the rural landscape. And we estimate that um, there are 91,000 livestock producers in Australia and the evidence is that they have an average of, of three to four working dogs, which surprised me. But they have also reporting to us an average of 25% of their dogs that were recruited for training will essentially fail to graduate and of course that ends up with the, the animals being euthanized um, so we were interested in how we could address this form of so-called wastage and um, we know that the outlay on dogs and the cost of maintaining dogs is far outstripped by the return they they bring on their investment we've calculated that it's at least a five times return on investment so that's why i think they might be well described as the unsung heroes these animals are so keen to work and contribute enormously to the rural economy we were particularly interested in behavioral genetics so we started off looking at what people actually value in their dogs and and how they can show some consensus on what is valued what traits are valued and what are less valued and then we started looking at the risk factors for low success we've published this in a paper in the public library of science also known as plos and that's an open access journal that your listeners can access so they don't have to go through a paywall or, or through a university library but it is a very good it's a highly respected journal and what we found was was that there were seven significant uh, factors that related to uh, farm dog success and and in terms of success was the, the reduced chance of dogs failing their training process and and a reduced chance of those dogs becoming wastage and the seven things that we uh, revealed was that of course it won't surprise your listeners to know that breed was important relationship with success and certainly for the dog the dog owners we were looking at we're asking um, questions of the kelpie came out top of the class so you increasing chances in australia of getting fewer dogs failing if you select a kelpie that's not to say that you don't want to try with a border collie or a, a coolie but this was what the data said and the paper discusses the reasons for that so it's, this is not a, an opportunity to disrespect other breeds it's an analysis of, of what the data said the next thing was that housing type was interesting and had a significant relationship with success the people who were chaining their dogs alone and this is a very common practice um, were reporting far less success than the, the people who were using yards and group housing of dogs in yards was associated with success we're not saying that there's a causal link we're just saying there's an association people who participate in trials get better results that's probably because they're spending more time practicing their own skills apart from anything else the age of uh, the dog acquisition was also associated with success so people who are acquiring dogs in their junior weeks and months were getting a better result and that points to the quality of the bond that the owners may have had with the, the dogs as it developed which won't surprise many of your listeners the other one that i'd like to touch on the next one i'd like to touch on is electric collar use because that was unsurprisingly i suppose associated with poor success 
And this concurs and aligns with previous studies that we've published showing that people who use electric collars tend to have lower levels of education. So it's, it's unfortunate that people with the, the least amount of training are reaching for the strongest and harshest tools. So this is a, another piece of evidence that suggests that positive reinforcement is definitely the, the first port of call. The next finding was that if when we asked people hypothetically how much would it, you be prepared to pay to get your dog af after an injury or an illness back into the workplace we asked them to estimate what their veterinary expense a hypothetical veterinary expense would peak out at and just the people who were prepared to invest more in getting their dogs sorted out by vets were also reporting more success that may just be a reflection rather than a causal relationship that may be a reflection of the, the commitment they have to, to training their dog and remediating unwelcome behaviors the conscientiousness score of the the owner's personality had a significant relationship with success so the people who are more conscientious were more likely to um, report success in the working dogs and this again confirms the role of, of dogmanship in this whole picture so some nice data in those studies to oh, i want to say back up a lot of common sense yeah you are you're absolutely entitled to use the word common sense good science starts with observations the generation of a hypothesis so a proposal that, that there is some sort of relationship between bodies of data and collect your data and test them against that hypothesis so these observations that we've all had are where much of my science comes from having been involved in competitive dog training i appreciated the importance of looking at the interactions between the humans and the dogs and i'm just so fortunate that i can get paid to explore <laughs> these and look at the data that underpin them yeah well, okay hey thanks so much for sharing paul i'm learning loads <laughs> and taking many notes cool I'm, I'm so glad we're doing this today for, for our next question i'd like to shift our focus a little bit and move on to talking about horses, specifically the use of the whip in horse racing. Can you discuss more on this topic for us, please, Paul? Sure. Yeah, I'd be delighted to. We know that when we're riding horses, we're, we're putting weight through their backs. So that weight can be shifted around, it can be moved, and it can be removed. And we, we know that when we remove something that's uncomfortable or even painful, then we're using negative reinforcement. It's the release of that pressure that the animal and reinforces the behavior it's just shown. So it is, in my view, impossible to sit on a horse without using some negative reinforcement and the obligation to use increasingly subtle cues. That's what defines the best trainers, in my view. The International Society of Recreation Science has gone to the effort of issuing a position statement on what is ethical and sustainable in um, the use of aversive stimuli. And I, I love watching liberty training of horses without gear on the ground. That's often achieved with positive reinforcement. But there are elements of negative reinforcement in there if you look closely. The onus on those of us who ride horses is to look for ethical ways of applying negative reinforcement because the eyes of the world are on us. And if we're not careful, will be accused of, of using brute force. The best example of that, I think, could be the use of the whip in racing because what we're seeing there is essentially professional riders who are extremely good at what they do on the whole being put under some pressure to be seen to be riding the horse out. They can actually, jockeys can be penalised if, if the stewards think that they haven't ridden out the horse on its merits. So in a sense, they are the jockeys are under pressure to use the whip. And we have to also accept that when we're seeing horses being whipped it's generally at the end of the race and they're not whipped at the start of the race they're whipped when they're essentially running very short of fuel and they are all slowing down they might look as though they're speeding up but i promise you at the end of the race they're actually showing less acceleration so we have to acknowledge that we are seeing tired horses being whipped in the name of sport and we need to ensure that this is explored properly because it could threaten racing if we don't get this right and um, there has been whip free racing in norway for at least 30 years and horses still win races in norway as you'd imagine if they're all on the same level playing field then the fastest horse that is ridden the best and has been prepared optimally will win so we can still have the spectacle of racing without the prospect that we're whipping tired horses our studies have shown that the rules are being breached far more than the industry would like that the padded whip is striking horses with its unpadded sections 64% of the time 
And these are troubling statistics for the industry who's looking for it to ensure the welfare of the horses is paramount because they suggest that the rules that are in place and the use of the padded whip is not sufficient as a safeguard to horse welfare. So this is the way in which science can help industry move to a more sustainable future. So I'm really pleased that we've been had the opportunity to, to work with industry on occasions to, to show what works and what doesn't and to reveal the influences that jockeys are under um, when they reach for the whip. Um, so of um, papers that I could point you to if you're interested to show what is revealed when you look very closely at the use of, of the whipping racing. But I would like to say that I am not anti-racing. I am really here to help. I'm really trying to help the industry move to more ethical models. And am I correct in saying that in Australia recently, the whip has changed its role in certain aspects of horse racing or certain areas of horse racing? Well, in harness racing, Ryan, the good news came through um, in December that, that, that the industry, the harness racing industry, you know, the people who are trotting and pacing using a, a sulky and a, and a standard bred horse, they have announced that um, they will abandon whip use in September this year, um, which makes them the first in the world to voluntarily abandon the whip. The Norwegian move, which is at least 30 years old, is was, was imposed on the industry by animal welfare legislation. But this is very good news for horses that the harness racing industry in Australia has decided to abandon whip use and strong suspicion I have is that they have evidence that using less of the whip has been associated with better race times so letting these wonderful extremely athletic animals do what they love to do which is to kick into that gear and really stride out if those of you who've driven a standard bred or ridden ridden a thoroughbred will know what I mean if you breed for speed you get joy showing speed in the same way as if you breed for sheep work the animals don't need scooby snacks to do their sheep work they love their sheep work if we allow the animals to these racing animals to do what they do best and we prepare them the right way and set them up for success and you know we have got evidence that whip use is not associated in thoroughbred racing at least with better placings in races so we're beginning to piece together the notion that whip use can actually detract from um, the performance and um, so we're kind of leading the world i'd say in in australia in revisiting the need for the whip in racing yeah great and thank you so much for sharing this Paul. Sadly now though we are nearing the end of the episode but I'm excited because this next part is one of my favorite parts of the show. It is story time. Paul would you be so kind as to share with everyone listening some stories from your career and some lessons you have learned along the way? I'd be delighted. I think I've got four minutes for this, so I'm going to have to speak fairly quickly. I guess one of the things that sticks out for me is is my journey through a PhD in, in horse behaviour and focusing on what were called at the time in the general horse owning community stable vices. These are this crib biting, wind sucking, weaving, box walking. When I was starting my PhD, PhD after five years as a vet in practice, vices were still being used to describe these behaviours. And the, the unfortunate aspect of that is that it implies that the horse is at fault. And what I've learned being over, over the course of, of my academic career has been a rejection of that term. And it's now replaced with stereotypies, which describes simply what you see in front of you, which is a repetitive, relatively invariant and apparently functionless, functionless behaviour. The beauty of this is that we are now learning through science and through data collection that it's the environment that the animals are in rather than the animal itself that is the, the chief causation of these behaviours. So the, the story for me that sticks out is that if you stick around for long enough, you see some great things happen. And I'd say the same about equitation science, that as we have grown as a society, the International Society for Equitation Science has helped horse riders and, and horse trainers appreciate the mechanisms that riders are applying. Rather than assuming that the horse is a willing participant, the science has revealed using, for instance, rain tension meters, the role of the contact that we have with the horse's mouth and how that horse does next. So data are our friends. And that's what scientists say, but I think that's what most animal trainers will eventually end up saying. Yes, they have an art form to consider and the wonderful balletic performance of a human together in, in a training situation can be quite beautiful but if we don't understand the, the mechanisms then we can make some grave errors and the worst outcome is that we blame the animal for being somehow um, malicious or in the case of stereotypies vicious when we're talking about stable vices so animal welfare science and equitation science to look at the, the data and look at the mechanisms 
before we start blaming the animals. And that's where it comes into its own eventually as well. The other thing I wanted to share with you was, was about Tinker, my dog. So I went to a farm looking for a blue fawn. Cooley was handed a puppy and the pup in front of me had clearly not been well handled. She was desperately cautious. She was fearful. And um, the farmer told me that he was going to destroy her if I didn't take her. So Tinker came home with me and has been with me for 12 years. Normally, I would have chosen a bold dog because as a trainer and as a, an academic with an interest in animal behavior, people expect me to have a perfectly behaved dog. I made room for Tinker and as a cautious or shy dog, what you might call on the human personality scale, an introvert has shown me so much. She She taught me how to behave around cautious and shy dogs in a way that my previous dogs being bold and outgoing had never taught me and so i'm super grateful to tinker for that lifelong lesson so it's been very sad to say goodbye to her this week yeah and we will once again uh, remember that we, we are dedicating this episode to tinker and then obviously sorry for that loss there but we, we can all of us i think as well as you learn from tinker paul because you had a message yeah. this year yeah it's so easy for us to to back the winners um, and forget that the homes of a help as trainers and as behavior therapists are occupied by the whole range of dogs, not just bold dogs. You know, you're supposed to go to a litter and pick the one that the dog that comes up to you. Let's remember that the people who arrive last of all to see those litters may well be presented with shy dogs. We need to have the skills to deal with those dogs, those anxious, shy and cautious dogs. And the best way to tap into their world is to spend time with them and actually live with them. So we can, we know we can success out of these dogs. And Tinker was an amazing companion and taught many, many young people how to behave around dogs. If I had not taken her into my world, she may well have been destroyed. It behoves us, those of us who may have the skills to help these dogs reach their potential, we could make room for those dogs in our homes and they would be the finest tutors in how to manage those dogs at that end of the spectrum. So this is just a call out for those listeners who may be able to make a home available to a cautious dog if you think you've got the skills that you'll be paid back in in buckets i promise you so great and i love hearing people's stories so thank you very much for sharing that paul uh, as, as mentioned cool. that does it does now bring us to the final question and i'm really keen to hear what you have to say on this one can you please take us into the future and share with the audience what you would like to see happen in the animal care world and with animal welfare over the next five to 10 years? Okay. I, I think I'd resonate with many of your previous podcast guests in saying that I think we should be kinder to each other in this animal care and animal welfare world. We shouldn't let egos and the need to be charismatic or enigmatic get in the way of what matters most, and, and that's the animals. And the key to all of this is letting data speak. Of course, I would say that because I'm a scientist, but I'd really like to envision a time when, for instance, there could be um, an exercise to make dog logbook into an animal training logbook and an app for people to collect the data that inform their practice, data that can be shared with networks such as the Animal Training Academy so that people can actually see what works. And um, I think we owe it to the animals that are in our care to these data and share them. And now we've got the technology such as Dog Log Book that we'd love to adapt for other training contexts. I think the future is very exciting if we appreciate that data are our friends. Yeah, and I love that you're saying that. I think some of my members might be sick of me saying, show me the data. <laughs> We've all got feelings about what works, but we can't really translate what it feels like to be in that moment without the data to back them up. So I'm not trying to strip any of the magic out of the interactions we have with animals and the love and the trust that we can build with them. I'm, I'm not suggesting that, that that is in any way devalued. It's actually underpinned by the data. Such great vision. And we, of course, are working really hard to make these things transpire as we move forward over the coming years. This has been a lot of fun and I've just learned so much from you today. And I'm very sure that over the coming years, I'm going to continue learning from you and the amazing work that you do. Consequently, from myself and on behalf of everyone listening, an ocean full of gratitude for coming on the show today. Thank you very much, Paul. You're very kind. I feel very positively 
reinforced. Thank you. <laughs> Fantastic. I hope as well that you out there enjoyed listening to this episode as much as we enjoyed making it. It has been so much fun and the information included within so important for us to get out there and share with everyone so that we can continue to improve animals' lives everywhere. As mentioned at the start, if you want to help out and do your part, please share this with those you know it will be well received and put it on all forms of social media or wherever you deem relevant. That would be mega appreciated. For this episode, though, I'm going to leave it there. Take care, polar bear, and you'll hear from us again soon.